ladies from Team Challenge and Melissa, good to see you guys. Let's let our Team Challenge ladies know we appreciate them being here. Amen. Amen. Well, are you ready for the word today? Amen. I am going to uh, preach on promises to those who wait upon the Lord. Promises to those who wait upon the Lord. Psalms chapter 27, and I'll read verses 13 and 14. And this is David speaking. And he says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let me, let me just say a quick prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to preach. May your spirit descend not only on my lips of clay, but on the hearts of every person under the sound of my voice. Let us be drawn upward toward you, Lord. For we come boldly to the throne of grace today, God, that we may find help in time of need. You promise, Lord, so as I preach, let your blessings be opened up upon your people. Stir our hearts, and we'll give you the praise. And the church agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. In the 27th chapter of the book of Psalms, we see a, a, a great tone of victory. What we see here is David, if you will, is almost, thank you, Pastor Christian, is almost walking on water, if you will. It reverberates with power. It reverberates with exuberance. And in and, and, and verse 1, he says, the Lord, the Lord is my, I like that, my, he's our, he's our personal God, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And then he goes on to say, the Lord is the strength of my life. Do you, you notice that statement? He doesn't say the Lord gives me strength for my... He says, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And what he's saying and declaring is I have total freedom from fear. And that's my prayer for all of us here today. That God would liberate us from every... God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. That fear, anxiety would be destroyed today in the name and the power of Jesus Christ. And we would say we're not afraid of anyone or anything like what David said. Why? Because I know who holds my future. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds my tomorrow. I don't fear Failure, because God is in charge. Because even if I happen to fall down, God says a righteous man falls seven times, but he picks him back up again. Can I tell you, if you've fallen, if you failed, God will pick you back up again. But you can't, while you're down, you can't go. No, you got to stretch out your hand, say, Lord, pick me up, Amen. You've got to ask, God's not going to give help to somebody who doesn't want his help. Now, he says here, when the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, come against me to eat up my flesh, it says they stumbled and fell. What he's saying here is they came at me, but God tripped them up. Amen. God put his foot out and knocked their feet out from underneath them. They fell flat on their face. They were not able to get to me to cause the harm. I guess we could say God dropped them with a karate kick. Amen. None of my enemies will overcome me. No matter how much the enemy attacks me. And I don't know about you, but as a church, ever since we broke through at Easter... Man, the enemy's been, a t every time we make that momentum, the enemy begins attacking and, and, and trying to hinder. But he says this, none of my enemies will overcome me, no matter how hard they try, no matter how many attacks they throw at my life. And then he gets even more bold. He says, even if I wake up in the morning and there's an army surrounding my house, he says, even in this, I'm not going to worry. I'm going to be confident because if God be for me, who can be against me? 
But then he goes a little bit farther than just talking, goes a little too far. He says, even if they start shooting, if bullets start flying in this, guess what? God is still going to protect me. He says, when I'm in trouble, in verse 5, he hides me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. He shelters me from the storms of life. And I love verse 6. This one ought to bless you. He says, when my head is down, he is the lifter of my head. He picks my head back up. Today, God wants to lift your head up. He wants you to shake off that discouragement, shake off that depression, shake up, lift up your eyes to the hills from whence cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord. And then he goes on to say this, even when my mother and my father forsake me. You know what that means? Some of us know what that means. Because what that means is that mom and dad are the last ones to forsake us. They stand by us when nobody else will. He says, even if I've burned all my bridges, nobody's with me. And then even if I've burned bridges with mom and dad, and I feel like I'm out here all alone, he says, man, even then, the Lord will pick me up. Even then, the Lord will help me. Even then, the Lord will deliver me. Even if everyone forsakes me, I'm still going to trust the Lord. Can I tell you, he's walking on water. This is how I want us to be at Harbor Light Church. I want us to walk on water when we leave out of this place today. I want us to feel the empowering of the Holy Spirit and the strengthening of God. But we must ask the question, how can David be so strong, so assured? I mean, it, it reverberates with power. He's strong. This is not a fake job. He's really, really in victory. What is the secret? Because guess what? It could have been much, much different. Because in other Psalms, he's depressed and discouraged and saying, Oh God, I feel like I'm so low, I can't look up, but I'm looking down still. And, and he says, God, all my enemies have attacked me. They've all betrayed me. And, and he's so discouraged in others. And he's crying out for God to come and deliver him. And even David himself acknowledges that it could have been different. Listen to his words in verse 13. He says, I had fainted. You know what that means, I had fainted? I, it means to lose heart. It means I had given up hope. If you will, I had thrown in the towel. I could have quit. I could have been depressed and discouraged and defeated instead of reverberating with power and victory. And so what is the difference? What is it that turned that, that, that morning into dancing? What is it that made the difference? He says this, but, three-letter word changes everything, but, I waited upon the Lord. Listen up, church. David doesn't say this in this exact words, but what I felt, what I saw in this, is what David is really saying here, indirectly, is that when I faced the battles and the challenges that could have depressed me, discouraged me, and, and, and knocked me out of the saddle, and messed me up and got me going in a bad direction, took me back to that junk, took me back to Egypt. See, I don't want to live in Egypt no more. I want to live in the promised land. And, 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 and what would, would have brought me back, but he says, I made a decision that when I go through these types of challenges and struggles, that I'm not going to just take care of it the old usual way that I've always done before I knew Christ. In other words, I am going to fight my battles on a spiritual level. I don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness. Can I tell you that God says, I want my people to understand that we need to fight our battles, not in the flesh, not with our own understanding, not with our own ingenuity. We need to fight our battles on a spiritual level and go to God... Amen. And get God involved. How many of you know David was King David? You know what that means? It means this guy had resources. He had 
counts, he, he, he had a whole committee of counselors just to advise him. And, and he had unlimited wealth, unlimited help and resources. And even though he had all that, he didn't turn to that when he faced a battle and a struggle. But he says, the Lord is my helper. He turned to God and he would fight his battles. Even though he had all that ability, he would lay it aside and he would fight his battle on a spiritual level. And I wish we would learn this, that, that we would come to a place in our lives that we don't just lean on, 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 on old Uncle Bozo or, or, or Auntie whoever, Auntie Sue, but, but we would begin to lean more on the Lord and fight our battles more spiritually than we do physically or in the natural. And we would have much greater power and breakthroughs in our lives. So the question must be asked, how are we fighting our battles? Are we fighting our battles in our flesh? Are we fighting our battles in our, uh, in our own wisdom and ingenuity? Well, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lay not on your own, ingenu on your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And today the challenge is I hear God say that he wants us to fight our battles more on the spiritual level than we do on the natural level. And what he's saying is, listen up, this is why me, David, if he was here talking right now, would say to us, this is why I was walking in victory instead of being defeated because I made a decision that if I will call on the Lord, wait on the Lord, get his counsel, that he would show up and display his power and his amazing ability to fix things in my life and pick me up out of the miry clay and set my foot on a rock to stay. Amen. But I had to wait on the Lord. In other words, I had to go to the Lord with my problem and fight the battle by going to the Lord on a spiritual level. Now listen to what he says here. He says, unless, before you do it on a spiritual level, you first got to say no to your own way. Amen. Now, this is what he says. Unless, listen to what he says. It, it would have been different unless I had believed. I mean, you need to believe in God. You need to believe in the power of God. You need to believe in God's ability. That God knows how to fix everything. That God wired you. He intricately formed you in your mother's womb. He knew you by name before you were born. He knows your uprising, your downrising. He knows every thought before you even think it. Your God knows who you are. And you need to believe Listen to what David believed. He believed God would help him. I could preach three sermons. I got all kinds of one, two, three points. You got to believe that God will help you. I'm not worthy, Pastor. But you know what I was doing just this last week? You, guess what? Nobody's worthy. Nobody's worthy, but if you will be honest with God and humble with God, no matter who, you, whether you don't even know God or whether you've been a Christian for 30 years, you, it's the same path. You have to be open and honest with God and believe that God wants to help you. You've got to believe that. The Lord is my helper. He is, he is, he is the one who picks me up when I'm down. He is the one... He, He's got me out of so many jams. So you've got to believe that he will help you. David also believed that he would see the goodness of God. Do, are you believing today that you're going to see the goodness of God in your life, your family, every, every area of your, your work, and, and whatever you put your... I, I believe God can give the Midas touch. I believe God can bless everything you put your hand to. Amen. When our ways please the Lord, he makes even our enemies to be. Everyone who you consider doesn't really favor you or like you. When your ways please the Lord, God will change their hearts. God can do all things. And, and, and so you have to believe that you will see the goodness of God. What that means is that even though this challenge is frustrating, 
on the other side, I believe that God's going to work good out of this and that the goodness of God is covering my life and that everything that happens in my life, everything he does and allows me to go through, God's going to bring goodness out of it. He is a good God. Don't ever get mad at God and say, God, you're unfair. Why did you do this to me? No, no, no. God is always good. God always has good plans for you. God always has good thoughts of you. God always wants to help you. But we have to get past the lie of the enemy that we are unworthy, we're no good. And tell you what, God says, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find help in time of need. And, 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 and you know what else he said? He says that I, I believe that I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord. You know what else he said? In the land of the living. Oh, this thing's going to kill me. Oh, no, no. What that means is he believed God would help him. He believed in the goodness of God, even though he didn't understand it. And yet he believed that I'm going to come out on the other side, blessed by the Lord. How many of you know God's going to, if he says, let's go to the other side, you're going to go... You're going to get to the other side. A man or woman who will walk with God will always get to their destination. God's going to get you. You need to believe that this difficulty, this challenge, this 600-pound gorilla that I hate is threatening my life. Guess what? You've got to believe that there's a new season coming and that God's going to get you through the other side and you're going to get past this. And, and I just want to tell you, you need to understand, you may not see a way out, you may not see how it can happen, but God has a thousand ways of fixing and solving every problem. And oh, I don't know if God's ever seen one like this before, man, I'm really in a mess. Well, let me assure you, after thousands of years working with billions of people, there is nothing unique about your life that God hasn't already solved a hundred times. Amen. God can fix our lives and God can help us in our, in our challenges. Somebody say praise the Lord. So, he says, so that was a separate message, so forget, no, don't forget it. But, okay, so what he says, wait on the Lord... Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. Psalm 62, 5, my soul, wait thou only upon God. Listen to this, for my expectation is from him. That's where he says, I'm expecting God to help me. I'm expecting God to be good to me. And I'm expecting God to get me through to the other side. Somebody give God praise for that right there. Amen. And, and when I read that, what I, what, what I sensed in my heart, what he's saying is that my expectation is from him. What that means is I'm going to fight my battle spiritually. In other words, my expectation of overcoming and moving forward, getting through this, is because I go to the Lord and my expectation is from him. You may have people help you. I mean, I mean if you're going to get anywhere, we, my son just graduated San Jose State this week with his uh, computer engineering degree, and he gave a little speech. He says, if this person hadn't helped me, this person, this person, and, and nobody gets a four-year degree on their own. Nobody, listen, you're never, ever going to move forward. Do, do, you, do you remember a guy named Alex Haley? He did the movie series Roots. It was a, it, really good. In his office, he had a, a four-by-four fence post right in the middle of his office and he had a turtle shell sitting right on top of that post and people were coming what on earth is this in your office for he says I keep that there to remind myself that the turtle didn't get there alone you're never going to get where you're going alone you don't you're not smart enough you're not wise enough you have to understand there are people that are going to help you, and we thank God for each and every one of them. However, we look above them, and we thank God, and our expectation is from God, even though he uses resources, he uses people. In other words, my expectation, David said, is from God, and that's pretty tricky. Because we get so used to handling things, taking care, get out of the way, let me take care of that, I'll, I'll fix that. And, and, and pretty soon, man... We're, we're just taking care of everything. We're just starting to run our own life, do things our own ways. And I, and I just got to let you know, we need to be dependent upon God. I, I, I've been 
a song in my heart all morning long and and just just actually crying as I seen it because I remember I would walk at a, par, a place called Kearney Park in Fresno I was singing this song and I remember seeing walking through the neighborhood seeing just the different places I've sang this song but it says you are all I need Jesus you are all I need you are all I need Jesus you're all I need and and, and that song has been in my heart and and, and there's, there's just this awareness that if I can just touch him if I if I can just wrap my arms around him and, and be close to him he's gonna take care this problem going on at work, oh, he'll fix that. This problem with the family, oh, he'll fix that. I just have that awareness that if I can just get Jesus, amen, he's going to move on my behalf. And those other things, I, I, I just see him as a solution to every problem and every situation in my life. Even though people help, even though people support, I know that God ultimately, my expectation is from God. Don't ever forget that. Yes, thank you. Acknowledge those who support you. Be kind, be thankful, be appreciative. But at the same time, when you go home, you throw your hands up in the air. You say, God, thank you for sending brother so-and-so. Thank you for sending her. And, and, and we, my sister got in trouble with that. You know what she did? Her, her van motor burned, blew up. So she, my dad wasn't serving the Lord at this time. And he lived in Ohio. So she calls up, Dad, I don't have no money. My engine blew up. Don't worry, babe. I'll go buy an engine and ship it off to you. So he goes searching high and low, buys an a, a, a engine, I don't know, from a junkyard or wherever he got it, put it on a pallet, paid to ship it out there. And then a, a couple years later, he was visiting from Ohio, and my sister's there in the living room with him, and, and uh, she's saying, yeah, when my van broke down, God sent me an engine for that van, and God was so good to me, and God blessed me. God gave me that engine. And then afterwards, my dad said, what on earth is she talking about? God didn't send that engine to her. I did. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and so she blew it there. We don't do that. We, we are thankful and appreciative. But I, I, I'm riding the point too long. But God, amen, God, my expectation, and this, my soul, wait thou only. David says, wait thou, I, 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 I look to God for the answer. And so I fight this on a spiritual level. My expectation is from him. And so, but this is what he did he, to gain victory. I, and, and, and here's a, another three points of a sermon. What he did is, is he put his focus. This is how David waited on the Lord. He put his focus completely on God. Can I tell you, we are so scatterbrained these days. All the time we're scatterbrained, and, and, and it probably has to do with those things we call smartphones. Amen. And, and, and how, how many of you ever been talking to somebody, they're, they're on their smartphone, and they're, they're like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and really, they're not listening. They're on their phone doing whatever they're doing. Because men can't do two things at once. <laughs> and, and the truth is, is that I feel sometimes that's how it is with God, is that God's trying to get through to us. But our minds are flying here, flying there. I got to do this. I got to get that done. It, that, that, that we're so scatterbrained. And David says, when I wait on the Lord, the first thing I do is I rest my mind. And, and he says, this one thing have I desired of the Lord. I love this. He didn't say two things, three things, four things. This one thing. What that means is he focused on God. And all the other thoughts, all the other distractions, he pushed them aside. Well, pastor, I try to do that, but I'm not too good at it. Well, well, maybe you just need to spend half a day then and spend the first two hours emptying out your mind and clearing your mind of all that stuff. Because God's trying to speak to us. God's trying to get through to us. But if we're too scatterbrained, it's hard for us to pay attention. I put in my notes, we need to be like Mary and not Martha. Mary is one who came Jesus and the disciples came Mary and Martha their sisters Martha plans a big meal for them just spontaneously and she needs help in the kitchen she looks over her sister Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus just eating up his words and 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 she says Jesus don't you care that she's sitting there on her can while I'm doing all this work tell her to get up and help me and Jesus says Martha Martha 
you are distracted and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good thing, and I'm not going to take it away from her. Can I tell you, I would encourage you, focus on Jesus, and then just call in for some tacos, amen, and don't, don't cook that big old meal. And so he put his focus, in, so he, he de, I put he decluttered his mind. Secondly, he sought after what he desired. He says, that will I, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. How many of you know we all have a lot of desires? But David, when he waited on the Lord, he put that desire into action. And, and, and say, if you want to lose 20 pounds, I know. Sunday morning, I shouldn't even mention that, but I did. If you want to lose 20 pounds, that's a, we all, well, not all of us, a lot of us like to lose 20 pounds. But guess what? Unless we put that desire to lose 20 pounds, I know guys that I've known for 30, 40 years, they're still saying, man, I'm, one of these days I'm going to start going to the gym. They've been saying it for 30 years. <laughs> and, and, and so David says, I take the desire and I put it into action. If you want to lose weight, you better join Weight Watchers or Craig Jenny or one of them. And they got all kinds of new ones now. Someone told me the other day, yeah, they got this new weight loss medication. I think I need to get some of that. And, and uh, I don't know what some of that is, but I uh, hope it's legal. Amen. And, and, and so he, he, here's, here's the thing. It, it, it's so easy to desire something, but it's even easier not to put that, into, that desire into action. And, and what the Lord wanted me to say right here is this, is that the Holy Spirit's going to be stirring your heart. God's going to be giving you desire to, to, to draw closer to Him. And when that desire comes, God wants you to act on it. God wants you to know that that isn't just you, that isn't just... Oh, just by half and chance. That's the Holy Spirit and God giving you a desire to press in and, and come closer to Him. And what God wanted me to remind you of today, when that comes, please act on it. Take that desire. Like, oh, man, I've just really been wanting to get close to God lately. <laughs> that ain't you. That's the Holy Spirit working in your life trying to prompt you to take that desire and to put it into action. It's got real quiet in here right now. And, and so what he did, he says, that will I seek after. And God wants us to respond when he stirs our hearts. That's enough right there for a message. God wants us to respond when he stirs our hearts. God says, <laughs> God says, what? Seek and you won't find. No. Not what he says. And we'll put that desire into action. Seek and you shall find. And then the next thing David did is he loved going to the house of the Lord. It says, one thing have I desired that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, how often? All the days of my life. What if we had church seven days a week? You know who probably the only one to show up would be David, Amen. But we need to have a desire. If we're waiting on God for a breakthrough and for a change in our lives, we need to be in the house of the Lord. This is God's design. This isn't just a good idea that some men came up with on how we can organize a church. This is God's plan. Hebrews 10, 25, he says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, such as the manner of some is, and especially all the more as you see the last days approaching. The last days are approaching, and more than ever, we need the worship together. We need the preaching of the word. We, we need the fellowship. We, amen. We need the bagels. Amen. <laughs> we need what God offers. And it's here for us. And, and God wants us to love his house. And if you're needing breakthroughs and change in your life, you know, you need to love his house. And let me speak to parents for a minute. You parents that bring your children and they go to the classes next door. That's the best thing you could ever, 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 ever do. 
They may not get all excited about Jesus right now, but down the road a little bit, guess what? When they need God and they, they, they're going to have that knowledge and that understanding and that seed's going to come to fruition and it's going to germinate. And, and that's why we... Thank you for bringing your children to the house of the Lord. Another thing that, that David did is that he beheld his beauty. To behold the beauty of the Lord. You need to see God as beautiful. He is so, so, so lovely. Amen. It says in the scriptures, the Lord is altogether lovely. He's beautiful. And every way he works in your life, it's beautiful. And, and, and you need to quit believing the hogwash. Amen. And you need to believe that God is beautiful and God has beautiful things for your life. And there's nothing God's ever going to take out of your life but that he's going to replace it with something better. And if God ever asks you to sacrifice in an area of your life, God's going to reward you with so much more on the other end. So much more. But, but, but God is beautiful and we need to see his beautiful. Beauty, And we need to believe he wants to do something beautiful in our lives. And then he says, to inquire in his temple. I love this. He, to, this means to search after, and it means to have discernment. What this means is that David says, when I fight a battle spiritually, I don't just do what I want to do or what someone from the neighborhood, you know, Brother Gus down there, you know, tells me to do. No, he says, I come and I inquire, I come to church. You know, it's so good when church is over, they play worship music. This is sit in your seat and just talk to the Lord a little bit. And maybe there's some problems in your life. You need direction for it. It means, it means to come to God in prayer, searching and seeking for direction or answers for something. You're not sure how to go about it. That's what that means, to inquire in his temple. God wants us to ask him how to do the things that we need to do. He wants to, amen, be our guide and be our helper. And, and, and I'm not going to just take care of business like I normally do, but I want to come to his house. I want to seek his direction and his will. And, and so this is how I wait on the Lord. I declutter my life and I focus on God. I seek after God when the Holy Spirit stirs me. I stay consistent in attending the house of God. I see God is beautiful and I inquire for God's will and direction to be done in my life. Somebody say, that's good preaching right there. So, so now we need courage though, don't we? While we're waiting on God for something, we need courage. He says, wait on the Lord. And he says in verse 14, and be of good courage. Because you're going to need some courage. When you're having a financial meltdown, you're going to need, amen, some courage to endure and to be strong through that. When the doctor tells you you've got a health problem, you're going to need some courage to be strong and to go through that. When you live in this area and you need housing, you've lost your housing, you're going to need some courage, amen, to wait on the Lord until he opens up the place. And don't settle for plan B, amen. Don't move in with a bunch of dopies or something or numbskulls, amen. You wait to, for the place that God gives you where you can grow in him, love him, and be who he wants you to be. Our marriages are sometimes problematic. I love my little saying, you've probably heard it before, marriage is like flies on a screen door. Those that are out are wanting in and those that are in are wanting out, amen. <laughs> it, 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 it's because God, if God sees the rigors of single life will help us to become more like Christ, he'll let us stay single more. If God sees that the rigors of marriage life, let me just tell you something, Amen. God designs the family to teach us and to instruct us. And the biggest example I can give you is every time we would get in our suburban, all five of us, and, and, and actually six of us, uh, it would be time to leave. And we, you know, just getting six people in a car to go, that's a job. But I have a certain son, not Jordan, I won't mention his name. Every time we got in the car to go, he'd say, oh, my stomach, I got to go use the bathroom. Every time, and he would be 15, 20 more minutes in there while we all sat in the car. 
How do you know? The back of my hair stood up on my head. Why didn't you do that before we got in the car, son? The other kids, oh, man, everybody's complaining, right? But after about two years of it, we all just begin to get a little more mellow, and we learned, our le we, we learned patience. We learned understanding. What if it was our stomach? How would we feel? And instead of just jumping to being impatient and being mean and all that, in that family setting, we all learned patience. We learned how to love when someone doesn't do us. But, but many people, you've never grown up in a, in a family where you had that kind of structure. And, and, and so where, where did you ever learn how to humble yourself and how to be kind and humble to others when you have difficulties and problems? And here you are now wanting to get a great looking wife and you're wanting to have a macho man who can take care of you. If God gave them to you right now, it would probably be a disaster. Until we learn how to get along and humble and be who God wants us to be, well, I, I'm going to give 50% because I'm strong in this area. Yeah, I'll give 50% together we make 100%. No, you don't. <laughs> together you make a whirlwind. Amen. The truth is, is that you got to get to be 100%, sir, and she's got to get to be 100%, and then you come together, and God does something beautiful and mighty and powerful through. Why does God bring two together? Not just so you can live happily ever after. He says that he might seek godly fruit. God wants us to raise our children in the ways of the Lord and be an example as a family unit of what it means to serve and live for Jesus. So, so that's why we're so happy to have a small part in helping people to become more like Christ. And, and, and we cherish and honor the, the privilege to be able to do that. So I say thank you for coming. We can't do that if you don't show up or you're not part of this community. It's hard to really help you to, to become who God wants you to be. So, so we love you. Amen. I don't know where I'm going with that. Okay, now, <laughs> we need courage when things are getting worse before they get better. How many of you know sometimes, man, we're waiting on something and things get, don't get better. They get worse. You know how you make it through that? God told Joshua, only be strong and very courageous. He says, neither be thou dismayed. You know what that word dismayed means? It means don't be in shock when you hear bad news. So whenever bad news hits you, don't fall apart, amen, like an old wooden dilapidated rocking chair. Stand back and say, I'm not going to allow this to settle into my spirit and my mind and bring me depression and discouragement. I'm going to fight the battle in my mind, and instead I'm going to focus on the greatness of God. But be not dismayed. That means don't let sudden bad news send you into a tailspin. Immediately fight the battle right there, right there. Fight it right there. Because once it takes root in our spirit, in our heart, and we're doing that courtroom scene, it's going back and forth, man, I'll tell you what, it already got us all discouraged and beat up. And, and, and he says, fight it right at the beginning. And he says, only be thou strong and very courageous. Have not I commanded you? Says the Lord, go forth, I've, this land I've given to you, every place the sole of your foot shall tread, I've given unto you. As I said unto Moses, can I tell you, God said to him, be strong and courageous. We're going to have to be courageous while we wait on the Lord. Because God doesn't always do things in our timing. And he certainly doesn't do things our way how we think. But that's where trust comes in. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. And if we'll do that, listen to what God says he'll do. He says, Isaiah 49, 23, they that they... For they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. If you wait on God, if you fight your battles spiritually and you wait on God, others might say you're crazy, you need to take care of that yourself, you need to give them a piece of your mind. Don't give them too many pieces because there's not that many left. Amen. <laughs> In, <laughs> I didn't mean that mean, okay. And, and <laughs> where was I at? <laughs> and, and, and so we need to do things God's way. That'll always bring me back to, to base here. And, and, and they might say you're crazy, but guess what? God says if you wait on me and fight your battles on a spiritual level, you will not be ashamed. In other words, when they see you later down the road, 
They're going to see that you came through that. You had victory and God's blessing was on your life. He promises you will not be ashamed. He will strengthen you. Listen to this. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. And what I love about this, I really do, is the fact that it's so easy to act strong. Oh, yeah, I'm strong. Hallelujah. And, and, and the truth is, how you doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing great. Praise the Lord. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You're just acting strong. But you, what did he say? Wait on the Lord. Be of good, good courage. Be good courage. That means you're, you, it's fighting against you because you're having to be courageous. I like what John Wayne said. Uh, uh, being courageous is... Uh, saddling up anyways, even though you're going to get shot or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> something like that. I think I got it wrong. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, 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 and so God says that, that he shall strengthen what? Thine heart. You know what that means? It means that God says, I'm going to go down deep inside where nobody else can go. And I'm going to give you what I call real strength. I'm going to give you a strength that's supernatural. And I said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living. People won't understand why you're so strong and why you're able just to, amen, laugh at danger and just keep moving. It's because God himself has reached down into your heart and by the power of his Holy Spirit, he has strengthened your heart. And then when you say, yeah, I'm doing great, guess what? You're really doing great because it comes from the inside out. It's not a facade. It's not a fake job. And that's what God is longing to do in our lives. He doesn't want us to act Christian, act strong. He wants to make us strong. He wants to revolutionize our lives and give us strength and victory like we couldn't imagine, like we've never had before. So God works in our hearts. It's different when you have strength in the heart than when, when you do, you can overcome any obstacle in your life. So while you're waiting for that, you're being courageous, then God says, when I see you fighting against that, being courageous and fighting this battle on a spiritual level, he says, then I'm going to strengthen you. Uh, now you're going now you're going to have me come along your side and I'm going to touch your heart with supernatural strength and you're going to have so much more strength than you even realize in order to conquer and to be victorious. Listen to this. Isaiah 40:31 But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait on the Lord, what, shall renew their strength. And we have to renew our strength. Amen. And that's what God does. You might, you might feel so weak. You're fighting about it. You're just like ready to die one day. Next day you're over here singing, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible. Oh, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. Why? Because God strengthened you, amen, in your heart. And then he says, I will exalt you. Listen, li listen. rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. There's, there's, there's the key. In your patience, possess ye your souls. That's what the scripture says. Rest in the Lord. In other words, if you're facing a challenge, you need to rest in the Lord. You can't carry that burden and that weight. It's too much for you. You need to cast your care upon the Lord because he cares for you. And God says, I, how, how many of you know, to exalt means he'll, he'll lift you up, he'll raise you up. How many of you know, you can't get, how hard is it to get up when you've got this big old burden and weight on you? No, cast that care on the Lord. God didn't design you to carry big mountain boulders of weight. He designed you to carry little, three little stones and a slingshot so you can slay the enemy. Amen. Not big burdens that weigh you down and frustrate you. We're, we're, we're carrying the wrong stones. God says, get rid of them big old weights. Get rid of them. And so he's going to raise you up. Then lastly, Psalm 62, 5. My soul wait thou only upon God for my expectation is from him. In other words... 
in prayer, I believe that God is going to answer my prayer and that God is going to give me the breakthrough, the help, the victory. He says, all my expectations, not some, all my expectations are from him. And in Psalms 34, 6, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Waiting for God means this. Have you ever seen a group of people that are just sitting around passing the breeze and they're just, just sitting there, I don't know what they're waiting for, but they look like they're just sitting there waiting. No real purpose to it. But then if you went by a bus stop, you've seen somebody sitting on the bus stop and they're going like this. You see the bus yet? And, and, and this word wait on the Lord, it's not the guy sitting around just passing the bridge. It's the one who's over here expecting that bus to come and they're looking because they're expecting the bus to come around the corner. So when we wait on the Lord, we don't wait just idly, just uh, dormant. No, we believe that God wants to help us, that God is beautiful and has good things for our lives and that God is going to help us overcome these challenges that we face in life, whatever that might be. And not only do we, do we believe, but we're looking for it because we're praying about it. We're, our expecta if we're expecting it from man or resources that we have, guess what? Well, if the resources are good, I might get it. Not, no, I'm not going to get it. Oh, you'll be like a pogo stick up there. But if you're looking to God, you can forget about this and God and expect him to come through. God will come through for you. Today I preached about the promises to those who wait upon the Lord. And I can't help but feel in my heart that what God is really wanting to say, the big picture, it's so hard, so many truths, but the big picture is that at what level are we fighting our spiritual battles? Are we fighting them with our own ingenuity and resources? Or are we have all of our expectation toward God and we're waiting and expecting God to come through and to help us and to change us? And are we willing to do that with patience? Anybody can do that for a week or two. Can you do it for five years? Can you, can, because guess what? After you overcome this challenge, another challenge might come down the road. In this life, you should have We have to make this a pattern and a habit of how we live. It's not just a one-time deal to get over one hump. It, it's how we live our lives. And we become a light to this world because they see we have hope. Even though everything in our life might be falling apart, yet we have hope. It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. People don't get it. People don't understand. They used to see me going to church with a big old King James Bible. And, 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 and they said, they just looked at that. said, oh, that guy's religious. They had no idea what was going on in my heart. They couldn't get it. God had changed me. God had transformed me. And, and, and so uh, God wants us to fight our battles on a spiritual level, waiting on him. And so God today, I believe, has spoken to us. And would you stand with me just all across the building? Let's, can you give me a minute before we dismiss just so I can say a prayer? And, and um, Father, we just pray right now that you, would, that you would speak to our hearts even now, Lord. Holy Spirit, God, bless your people. Invade their lives right now, God. Just let your heart be open to the Lord for just a moment as we stand here in his presence. Just, just, just love him in your own way. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to stir us. He wants to speak to us. He wants to give us hope this morning. He wants to remove heaviness and take those burdens from us. He, he, he wants us to be victorious. And the way that happens is when we wait on the Lord because we're not smart enough. We don't have enough resources to fix everything. But God knows how to do that. And today I'm going to do a little different altar call. Today I, I want to just ask you, 
Maybe you're facing a challenge. And today your, your heart's desire would be, you know what, I don't want to fight this my way. I don't want to come against this giant in my own strength. But I want to wait for the Lord. I want to look to the Lord. I want to take this challenge that's before me right now. And I want to fight it on a spiritual level. Not in my flesh, not in my own way, but I want to fight it God's way. And the first step in doing that, of course, if you're not even surrendered your life to Christ, the first step is to surrender your life to Christ. Give it to Him and invite Him to be your Lord and Savior. And so let me ask if you're here and you say, Pastor, that's me. I, I need to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. And no one looking around, but just, just lift your hand if you would. Just say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you for your honesty today. I see several hands, so I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now just of accepting Christ. Church, would you say this prayer with me? And if you want to receive Christ, say this prayer and mean it from your heart. Dear Jesus, I invite you into my life to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Please forgive me of all my sins. I give my life to you. Now, if you're here today, I want to just step a little bit further now. And you're here and you have challenges that you're facing. Maybe a little overwhelming. I have no idea what they might be, but God does. And if you want to say today, Pastor, I don't want to fight this my own way. I don't want to fight it on a natural level. But I want to fight this challenge in a way that, 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 that it would be a spiritually fought battle that I would put my expectation, that I would believe today for God's help. I would believe that God is beautiful, that he has good things for me. He says that I would see the goodness of God. Believe that you'll see the goodness of God. And I'm going to ask those of you that would, I'd love a chance to pray with you down here in this altar. If you would step out and come and fill this altar. If you, if you want to face your challenges on a spiritual level, Maybe you have a specific challenge you want to give to the Lord today. I'm going to invite you to come. I'm just going to wait right here. Just step out from where you're at and come down here and join me right at the front of the church. And we're going to say a, a prayer for you. And we're going to pray with you today. And we're going to just turn these challenges over to God. And we're going to fight these on a spiritual level. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Nothing's too hard for God. And one thing that God's attracted to is a broken and a contrite heart. When we come to Him in our brokenness and ask for His help, we become irresistible to God. But God searches our hearts. He's just looking for honesty in our hearts. And so I want to say a prayer for you today. Father, I pray for these that are here in front of me. They are facing mountains and challenges in their lives. Today, God, they want to fight that on a spiritual level. So we give every issue, every situation that pertains to their lives into your hands.